All right, we're live. If you are somebody who is working in your organization, is working in your organization and there's a bit of feedback, if you're somebody working in your organization who is responsible for part of the growth of the organization, if you're part, say you're a quality manager, for example, you're looking at customer satisfaction, making recommendations for improvement. If you're a general manager, middle level manager, and you're associated with the people that are responsible for reaching out to new customers and helping to grow your business, I have got a special guest with here, with us here today in the studio for today's live stream. It's Michael Haynes, small uh -huh. business advisor and author. How'd I go? Uh, and uh, Michael Haynes is the author of uh, Listen. See, I'm getting it right now. Listen, Innovate, Grow, uh, this fantastic book that we've been campaigning for the last six or so months. I think we've been talking about it. He came and spoke at our um, Business Vision Summit, the 2020 Business Vision Summit earlier this year. Uh, what we thought we'd do today is run a bit of a workshop where Michael's going to talk about some of the principles, techniques, tips and tricks in terms of helping your business climb out of the COVID-19 crisis. So if you're an organization or you're part of an organization that is looking to scale up and grow, if you're part of an organization that is flatlining and you want to grow, or if you're part of an organization that's had a revenue decline and you're really thinking about how you can climb back out of the COVID crisis, today's the day to be getting on and asking some questions. Uh, we will keep the recording of this session today, so it's going to be available on the YouTube channel as it always is. But if there are people, if you're watching live on LinkedIn and there are people that are part of business development, account management, customer service, customer focus, strategy in your organization, they're the people to tag. So tag them in the comments so that they get the notification if you're on LinkedIn. So search their name, tag them in the comments. And as always, it's good to know where everyone's watching from. So we've got a couple of, couple of people already watching. Hello, Helen again from Port Stevens. Um, Vanessa, this is our dashboard over here, Michael, yes, so we can see it. what's going yes. on. LinkedIn hey, on the right, YouTube on the left. So um, Claire Williams uh, from Queensland. So today's the day to really be thinking about growth of your organization. This is a business to business growth strategy workshop and we're looking at, at, at account management and strategically reaching out. I'm not gonna steal Michael's thunder because he's right. gonna talk about that, but what I am gonna do it's going to be interrupting with Kobe yeah, today. Absolutely. I'm going to absolutely. interrupt. Bring it on. Um, we're going to talk about some case studies. So I'm going to grab my uh, phone. I'm going to search your organizations and I'm going to give you some tips and tricks as accurate case studies for your organization. So I'll grab my iPhone. I'm going to do that while Michael's talking. So please let me know where you're watching from. Uh, if you want to put the website or the web link for your organization, today's the day to get free advice on this. Hey, Angie. Um, so I'm going to give Angie some tips. I'm going to go find Claire's organization. I'm going to go find Helen's organization. And we're going to give, be giving you guys some tips and tricks and strategies to grow your organization. So welcome, Michael. Thank you Thanks for much. joining us. Okay. We're going to socially distance now. Yeah, um, that's all right. And I apologize for the background noise. Uh, we have got some builders doing an office fit out next door. Um, it has been a little bit noisy. So I apologize for that. So anybody who's just come on, let me know where you're watching from. Hit that like button uh, so that we can see you're paying attention. Hey, Carl, good to talk to you yesterday. Um, and hey, Mel, thanks for joining us again. So over to you, Michael. Okay, thank you very much. So hello, everyone. So today, really, what I want to be focusing on is that now that we're starting to see some uh, business recovery, particularly here in Australia, and we've got, you know, new financial year coming up, really want to be giving you guys some tips on what you need to be doing to uh, restarting your businesses, driving those revenues uh, that you're trying to get going with. Now, in B2B, I know a lot of people want to talk about it's very important about being customer focused, but to really start re-kicking your, starting your businesses, really driving those revenues, we need to be focusing and thinking about the buyers. So one of the first things I want to talk about today is really helping you get an understanding of, of where business buyers are right day, today, now, June uh, 10th. So previous to COVID, you know, your modern um, business buyers, you know, so those selling to business and or government had some pretty typical characteristics. One, there are buyers that do a lot of self-educating. So they do a lot of reading, going to a lot of events, online, offline, reading a lot of articles, webinars, et cetera. So they're pretty uh, educated and well-schooled in terms of what they need to the point that 75% of buyers won't talk to a salesperson until they actually know what exactly they need. So that creates a bit of a challenge and complexity. These business buyers are also ones who use a number of different sources as well in terms of trying to really get up to speed as to what's going on, what they need. Also a bit of a level of skepticism and trust, uh, you know, not wanting to be sold to too quickly as well. 
So these are some of the kinds of things we're dealing up until January, February, pre-COVID. Now with you know, COVID and we're coming out of that, you have all those characteristics of multiple buyers, doing, uh, buyers being heavily educated, buyers being quite demanding, but they're also feeling quite resistant. They're quite risk averse. So they're really trying to avoid uh, making uh, you know, rash decisions, you know, trying to avoid any risks, uh, unnecessary spend, feeling a lot of pressure in terms of trying to rejuvenate their businesses and really trying to get through, uh, you know, dealing with cost constraints, dealing with shareholders. So we're saying, what does all this mean, Michael? Well, what this all means is that business buyers now are fundamentally looking for four things, and I'm actually going to write them on the board. So one, not to be. Okay. okay, number one, what your business buyers are looking for are they're looking for insights and guiding. So they want to have some understanding with respect to their industries, their markets. What are the things that they're supposed to be doing to try to get their businesses started and trying to meet their key priorities and objectives? Number two, they're looking for actionable solutions. And I'm going to go into more of that as well. But they really want solutions that they can start getting some quick wins, getting some things on the go to start restarting their businesses now and start generating revenues now. They want to get the opportunity to connect. So be able to connect with subject matter experts, other people within their uh, industry, so they can start exchanging ideas. And they also want no pressure to buy. That's another thing that they're looking for. So these are the four things that they're looking for. And I would actually call what they, they're looking for at the day is, is they're looking for decision confidence. They know they have to take action, but they want certainty. They want some advice. They want clarity as to how to go about doing so. So this makes a great opportunity for us as small, medium business owners, because as I've always said before, Kobe, the days of knowing hiring, no one gets hired for firing. Hiring, no one gets fired for hiring IBM or over. Now, even particularly more so, businesses are open. They need the ideas, they need the direction, they need the guidance. So it's really all about decision confidence. And if nothing else, I want you to be keeping that in your mind that every meeting, every meeting, every phone call, every Zoom call, and um, although you may be tired on Zoom, I'm going to talk later on as to why you want to keep doing those face-to-face -face interaction, but it's all about doing this because business uh, owners, managers know they have to move forward. Here in Australia, we've got July 1, new financial year. We have to move forward. It's all about instilling decision confidence. Excellent. I'm going to jump in. This is interrupting with Kobe. Go for it. So before Michael gets too far into this, I just want to give you guys some case studies. So just looking at the businesses that are in the list and the ones that I know. So I'm going to start with Ash Bauman uh, with your organization. So when you guys are thinking about doing your defense tenders or your government tenders and thinking about your organization, connecting with the project managers, connecting with the architects, connecting with the sub consultants that are working in your organization and offering those guys insights in terms of what went well, what you've been finding, what you've been observing, because you're in, you're in the moment, you're in the project and you're getting a lot of detail and that's going to help them inform their decisions and become expert knowledge in terms of out in the marketplace and also help de-risk the projects, de-risking price, de-risking timeline, uh, increasing the you know the life cycle analysis or the or the lifespan of the asset that you're constructing. So when you guys start to think about insights, it's starting to think about who are your stakeholders. When you're looking at your management system, you're doing your stakeholders and interested parties analysis. What guidance and value can you offer those guys? So we might go and survey our, survey our customers. We're surveying these partners or the people that we collaborate with on the project, whether they're engaged by the client or engaged by you or the people that you're working with to actually pull these insights together. So your, your website, if you like, your social media, your outlets of information where your clients are going to stalk you or your tender submission becomes a, a source of valuable research data information. So for example, you could start your tender submissions and this is for everybody. Uh, we understand that dot, 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 these are, these are items of value or these are that's data and information on the project. We understand that there can be a risk from a timeline perspective. We understand there can be a risk from a material goods, supply chain perspective, all those sorts of elements. So I want you to think about that from an insects, insights perspective. Actionable items and solutions there is to say, we can help you or you can go and do this step. So do some research into supply chain, do some further research into life cycle analysis of materials being specified in the project. Do some further research into different construction methodologies. 
For you, Stan, when you're starting to look about this, which could be these are, you know, public venue risk register template that we use. Here is the venue business continuity plan. Here are some action items for the types of risks and hazards that exist at different properties that other people are managing. So you can come in as your professional organization, say to your client, we understand from running other venues where we've had these other mistakes. These are the kinds Absolutely. of things that you guys can avoid. So the mistake, they're not making the mistake or they're not having the risk or the hazard come to fruition. And to add to that, as part of those insights, when you can provide that view as to what are some of the comparative solutions, uh, processes, methodologies in the marketplace and give some insights as to how, why they might work, why they might work, not work. Give that third party objective of view. What's the view as to a reasonable solution? If you're trying to input some process system, well, what is reasonable? If you're saying you need COVID, a good solution for best practice, well, a reasonable solution, an ideal solution will have to have A, B, C, D. Yes, you want F and G, but that might not be able to be feasible. So providing that insight and guidance as to alternatives in terms of process, methodologies, um, competitive solutions, that will be quite valuable because business decision makers, again, it's about the confidence to say, what is it that um, they really need? What do they need to be considering? With yeah. regard to tendering, um, so those government tenders, um, th that's something I've done a little bit of work in. You definitely have to be, be filling in all the criteria that they state within those documents. Um, when they're looking for a lot of quantifiable business case uh, in terms of numbers, what they are actually looking for in terms of numbers, in terms of process methodology, they want to see reasonableness. So it's not a matter of the numbers has to be your NPV, your IRR has to be to the exact degree. They want to see that there is reasonableness in your methodology, in your process, so that there is a comfort level. Um, so you have to go through and fill all of those, but it's around the reasonableness. That's really what they're going to be judging for. Yeah. In terms of government tenders, and if you're going to things like education, uh, school boards, this is where having your network where you can start talking to other people in the organization, because people in procurement generally do ticks on the box. It will be those subject matter experts, those buyers, those influencers that will go in the detail. I can tell you as yeah. fact, as being someone yeah. who has been on the buying side. So you really want to tap into your network so you can get the inside scoop to say, of the 10 questions on within the tender, okay, it's really questions three, five, and seven that we're actually going to be looking for. And actually, they're really going to want to know about the implementation, the risk component, so really zero on that. So really leverage your network to really find out who is ultimately going to be giving the uh, that final decision and what are really the key levers and components? Because often the tender, it's kind of to just weed people out and say, there's a certain bar, a certain level we want to meet, but there could be certain components that you can only find through your network, through your additional research you can find. Well, really, we really want to know all about the implementation and support plan. We'll look at everyone else's numbers, but that component, how they're going to manage risk, how they're going to ensure that we can execute. Because at the end of the day now in B2B, everyone wants to know about execution and implementation. Yeah. So it's not about selling your product anymore. It's how are you going to ensure you are going to give me the outcome, the change that I want to achieve. And you must be able to display the implementation and that post-sale support up front, which is where most salespeople don't do it. And that's why they fail. And that's what, particularly when you're getting to CEO level, that's what they, they want security minimization of it. So you must be able to give insight to say, who else is doing what, what's worked and what to be mindful of, but also that roadmap of how you're going to get there, how you're going to mitigate risk, risks that are important to them is, is quite critical. Excellent. So I'll just jump back in and finish this off in terms of connecting and connecting with your organization and then no pressure that I've, I said it in one of our, our live streams a couple of weeks ago. It's about going shopping with friends. So the trusted advisor, and it comes down to no pressure, is your friends don't necessarily, they'll put a bit of peer pressure on you, but it's about you know, the massive information gathering to be focusing on the key points that they're the key problems or the key challenges that they're looking to solve. So what Michael's talking about here with decision confidence is about you being, you know, right now as a business owner myself, I can't afford to take massive risks. We don't, we're not making enormous profits like we were. Yep. Um, we haven't got that extra cream to be investing in building. So I'm taking a little bit more time to make my decisions and I'm going to trusted sources. I'm looking at referral sources. I'm looking at word of mouth referral. I'm trying to get advice where I haven't built that trusted relationship. So for you, Angie, with your business and, and knowing what you're doing from a, um, from a business development perspective, starting to see that you are the trusted, safe solution. And so that might take a little bit more time to truly understand the problem that you're solving with the client and do a little bit of a deep dive and saying, okay, just talk me through what are your challenges? What does success look like in 12 months? You know, what are you prepared to invest? You know, what is a risk? 
What does disaster look like for you? And so that they can start to think about, you know, am I doing this because it's an insurance policy? Am I doing this because I want compliance reporting when I'm getting asked to show information? Or am I doing it as a foundation to build my business? So starting to really go in and start to say, okay, well, Angie, you know, when you're looking at that project, who are going to be the other people? I don't want to steal Michael's thunder, but as we start to think about who are the other people as part of that process so that you can get that decision confidence with some of the other people that are part of that. And just to build on Kobe's point in terms of that, uh, delivering that value, that insights up front, that needs to be part of your selling process. You need to spend that time up front now. And particularly as you're going higher up the food chain, because that is what decision makers are looking for. They're looking for, give me some ideas, some advice. Even from that first Zoom call, that first meeting, you must be delivering value, getting them to think differently, opening up their eyes as to what's going on in their industry, what's going on in their markets. In terms of the particular problem, opportunity, or threat, what's going on, um, how they should be looking at it, how they should be looking at it differently. You need to be giving them something to think about and work with right up front. That is what they are looking for uh, because it's all about building that advice and giving them that guidance and being that trusted advisor. That's the key to selling now. So you must do your homework and you must be going into your meetings, even from that first call, with uh, some different ways of thinking, some different inform information, new ways of looking at things right from the get-go. Um, if it's anything that could easily be found on the internet fairly easily uh, with this look on the website or going on LinkedIn, then you haven't done your homework. Yeah, absolutely. I'm just typing in the comments. So drop the links in the comments here. I'm commenting on YouTube and I'm commenting on LinkedIn. Drop the links into your organization. And as Michael goes through his, his points, I'll give you live case study examples on your organizations. So again, so these are the, so again, just want you really keep in mind, it's all around decision, uh, it's all around decision confidence and really showing how you can really help your business, uh, targeted business buyers. And again, it's very important that you are identifying who are the business decision makers that pertain to your product or service category. Um, just a quick uh, watch out. I know a lot of people think, oh, if I'm going into a larger organization, I've got to tackle and get the Kobe's of the world, the group CEO. Doesn't work that way. You need to find out for your product or service category, who is the decision maker, who owns that project, who owns the budget. That's a person that you need to be uh, honing in on because many times people at that CEO, group CEO level, they often will be delegating uh, down to other people in the organization. So again, just to recap, so the four things that you really want to be mindful of, of your business buyers in as we're moving forward, business recovery, trying to get ahead, giving them insights and guidance, help guide what they want to do, think actionable solutions, where you can provide opportunities for them to connect with other people in their industry, other people in their markets, and a takeaway, no pressure to, uh, to, to buy. It's all about instilling decision confidence. So those are the four things that you, I really want you to be mindful of. Now, in terms of when you're going to approach organizations, and I'm going to rub this off now, so I'm going to put three other things. Now, many of us now, we're all, you know, um, looking, we're at mid the middle of the year, we're thinking, okay, we've got to be identifying those revenue, uh, and revenue and sales generating opportunities. Where do we start? What should we be thinking about? There are three things now that are going to be really on top of business buyers' minds um, in terms of business decision maker, in terms of when they're being approached about, in terms of wanting to spend money. Where do we put those markers? So there, there are three questions that a decision maker is going to want to know. Okay. First one, they want to know in terms of if they're contemplating to spend money. First thing they're going to ask themselves is, why do I have to change? So that's one question you're going to need to be, be able to ask. Second question. Oh, I should be right. Just go really fat. Let me just show you this. So, so first one is why change. Second one is. Thank you, sir. So first one is why change. The second one is why change now. And the third question is why you, i.e. why your company. These are the three questions that your decision makers are going to go, are going to be contemplating. 
So with regards to why chain, you need to demonstrate why for your, why it is that that decision maker needs to be making a change now. So what is going to be, and you do so by really demonstrating to them, what is the cost of inaction from them not implementing that new um, process improvement solution by not, um, for example, uh, offering a certain uh, product or service category. What are they going to be missing out? What is going to be the impact, the pain to them in terms of not meeting strategic priorities? Are there going to be financial implications? Are they going to be losing customers? Are there going to be potentially um, direct personal implications for them? So you need to demonstrate as to why change now. And this is where for the why change, this is where your insights that you can deliver to your prospective buyers comes in. This is where you're, you're bringing in new information, advice to them to say, well, we've worked with uh, 12 other um, customers in your industry. And in terms of uh, IT security management, what we're seeing is given the new environment, these companies are doing X, Y, Z, for example. So to de demonstrate why change is very important is that you want to demonstrate what is going to be the cost, the consequences, the pain of them not doing anything. Because in B2B, and particularly in this environment, status quo and doing nothing is what many uh, businesses are going to default to. So the first thing you need to demonstrate is, is that why change, why change now? Why change? Second thing you want to demonstrate is why do they need to be making the change now? And this is where you really want to show or that problem, that, uh, that threat, that opportunity, how big is it, what the scope of it is, and what is the impact? What is the impact of not uh, staying as things are now? What's going to be the impact, uh, current uh, impacts, which could be in terms of loss of revenues, more cost, uh, loss of market share. Um, and then also you want to be showing what is the impact of them not being able to achieve that desired outcome of being able to acquire more customers, gain more growth. You know, what are the, going to be those impacts? So you want to show what is not just why they need to change next, why they need to change, but why they need to change now, what is going to be the magnitude and the impact, and what's that gap between where they're at, where the business is at now, and what they're facing and where they want to be. Demonstrating that gap is really quite important. And so that's where you're going to be, again, really trying to demonstrate and show through, through case studies, um, through previous work that you've done with other clients. You may um, also may want to demonstrate using um, industry reports, et cetera, to really show what is going to be the impact of moving from where they're at today and some of those pains, some of those consequences they have and from where they want to be. Excellent. I'm going to jump in. So finish by you. And then, and then why you is you need to demonstrate why your organization as opposed to someone else. And this is where you need to be really focusing in about how you differentiate your company and how you can mitigate risk. And one of the keys to doing so here is really talking about implementation and execution and support, uh, as well as how you're going to mitigate risk as part of that implementation and execution support. Because it's this, it's that component of implementation and post-sales support where many, many BD customers, uh, providers don't focus on. And that's a key to how you win. Because you're going to demonstrate here, I'm going to show you, Mr. CEO, how we're going to get you to um, to that desired state of you know increasing your, your uh, sales and profit, getting into those markets so that you can avoid missing out on opportunities. And here's the roadmap. Here are all the things we're going to do and how we're going to work with you to get, to get there. And even when things go wrong, these are how we're going to mitigate the risks. Excellent. So I've just had a look at, um, I'll get to yours in a second, Angie, but I've had a look at um, Zach Markovic. I've had a look at your so LinkedIn. You've posted your link there. Adam Dent. Hello, Adam. Um, welcome to the show. <laughs> um, so what I want to do, just quickly do, I've had a look at both your websites. I'll have a look at yours a second in a second, Angie, I know uh, I know your business quite well. Um, so, Zach, uh, with with MrConsulting.com.au, as we're starting to look a bit look at this, uh, and this is going to apply to you as well, Adam. It's not necessarily why change. So, you know, obviously, um, one of the you know one of the core things is serving into serving into demand. So, so yes, we might have a great idea, and this is something that we want to do. But in this COVID nineteen environment, we want to be looking and seeing if there is traffic. So, so Zach, with your website, I just had a look and I can see what you want to be doing and I can see what you have been doing by the services that you're offering there on your website. But I want to ask you this question. In the current climate right now, what organisations are buying those services 
and which is the more likely, which one, you know, if you started to do some revenue analysis yourself of your whole industry, which one is the more likely one to be purchased? Now, yes, maybe in the medium to long term, I can see that personnel placement that sits there at the top of your services that you offer might be something that people are going to be doing. But there are a lot of organizations like right now keeping people on JobKeeper. They're trying to keep people organized. And I can't see that in the short term, placing people into roles unless there is an industry that is significantly, significantly exploding. Yes, there are industries like our business here, the factory that's running that has a dub, did a double month last month, but some of our other businesses in the group had half the revenue. So it would be important right now to be looking into the marketplace, look at people that you've worked with before. So I would go through your accounting system, whether it's zero or mind your own business. I would, I would look at export all of the invoices that you've raised since you started and I would look at those customers to see if any of those customers' businesses are growing and starting to make some phone calls. So the first thing there is to say, well, why change is did they use you? Did they change from you to use somebody else? Or are they using, you know, could they use more of you uh, in personal pl placement? But then when I look further down the list and I see things like auditing and verification and those things at the bottom of your list on your website, there are going to be people that are trying to keep incumbent people going because they're fearful of change. And I had a conversation like that this morning with a potential client. We're keen to change. We want to change, but everything's a little bit unknown, unknown right now. We're a little bit, we're not confident. And so we couldn't necessarily change, but they're still coming to us for insights and information. So we're doing a branding exercise and we've said, yes, absolutely. We'll look after you. You don't need to pay us any money. We'll keep servicing with some free stuff that we do and we'll keep them moving. So that's the thing that I want you to think about. Um, and, and start thinking about how could that be, you know, who's growing and who's not growing. Now, for you, Adam, with aeronaut.org, I've had a look at your website. My advice to you would be, again, saying who is the standard customer that buys the equipment? Um, they, they're going to be a little bit conservative. Maybe now is not the time to upgrade equipment. But I can say something interesting. Starting to look at who your customers sell to, who are their customers, and starting to look at whether their customers could bring their product, the products that you sell in-house. And you know this business here, Adam, you know where we are, where I am in the factory, you've been in here and you know what's going on. There are things happening in this factory where those things are being brought in-house that were previously done by suppliers and those suppliers that would be buying your equipment. So the market that you could start to look at, when we say why change, it's not necessarily change supplier, it could be saying to the organization, why change to bring that service in house? And so there are people that are buying your services and they're trying to keep people occupied. They're trying to retool their businesses. They're trying to do more. So those companies could sell more to their existing customers. So it's new product, existing product, new customer, existing customer. So you could be selling your existing product to new customers by going and looking for your customers, your traditional customers might not be doing a very good job of servicing their customers and start to look further up the supply chain. So you don't want to upset your customers that are existing, but if some businesses are drying up, you may have an opportunity to sell more of the smaller scale of your equipment into uh, some of those people further up the supply chain for your customers. Uh, for you, Angie, it's the same thing. So starting to think about, you know, traditional paper-based forms and reporting and software and starting to ask organizations, as you've, you know, you've moved remotely, as you're dealing with the COVID-19 crisis, can you automate and scale your business? Because your, your business there, Angie, with Focus IMS and Focus Biz, um, those two businesses in terms of being software platforms, anybody who's watching this stream, Ashley Bauman, you guys go and check out um, Angie's software. She's dropped the links on LinkedIn. Um, go and check that out, that Focus IMS. Now, when you're trying to move from a forms or a paper-based system to a larger system that's going to help scale your organization, you can start to grow your business without actually having to recruit more people. So I know that's a sad set of circumstances with lots of people losing their jobs, but in terms of having healthy, fiscally responsible businesses, uh, you're a good solution there, uh, Angie. So those things to think about. So I'll go and have a look at your website now, Angie, but Adam, I want you to start to think about this further up the supply chain in terms of those, that equipment that you have got and that you're representing and start to look at, okay, what's the addressable market? Where is the demand? Uh, where is that happening? Particularly here in Australia, where we're trying to regrow manufacturing. Over to you, Michael. Absolutely. Um, and just further, so for Angie, is, so she's implementing, so Wait, Angie, is, Angie. Is, that a, is that a process, getting organizations to do process change? 
Uh, it's a, it is, it is, um, it is a software process uh, system. So it's an integrated management system right. that would be, um, you know, reporting uh, online uh, online databases to manage data yeah. inside a business uh, for quality assurance, OHS reporting, yeah. environmental sustainability reporting. So right down the core of right. our client base, where we're running the certifications yeah. that you can see. So a key thing for yeah. Angie, though, in, in signing that in is is the whole change management piece. How is that change going to work? Yep. And so in terms of her selling her solution in, that will probably require a couple of meetings, a meeting initially with the first stakeholder, but then there's going to be a, a second meeting with probably more stakeholders to be talking around the whole change management. How is that going to be working? Because the key to selling that in is to demonstrate it's going to be as easy, Angie, as possible to, uh, for that organization to change from how they're doing to think today to tomorrow. And you really want to be demonstrating what is going to be the big upside and the benefit. But again, that's a classic one where implementation plan and showing how this is going to work, what's going to go wrong and how you're going to address when things go wrong is going to be very important as part of that. Because the, and in this environment, particularly the quickest thing when we don't want to spend, we don't endure additional costs and we're under a lot of pressure is to do nothing and keep doing things as they are today. So you have to demonstrate that, impl imp that implementation and what is going to be that that benefit? What's going to be how much better off you're going to be um, through increased productivity, productivity, efficiency, saving? You really need to demonstrate that as part of of, of getting that sale to push move, to move forward. Because um, it's why it's it's the why because that big why change you really have to demonstrate that big benefit as opposed to well I'm doing because otherwise you'll get into well what we're doing it's not great but it's good enough. And in this environment where everyone's got cost constraints, to get them to move, you really have to, um, if you do nothing else when you're having a, a, a call with a prospect, is to really demonstrate that gap of where they're at, um, where they could be, and what's the, what's the cost of an action? What are they potentially missing out in terms of savings, outside but not doing so? If nothing else, you want to get to that and demonstrate that pretty quickly because you need to move them from that. And with systems type things, that's often an area where folks will be sitting on, well, we do it, we do it manual. It's good enough right now. I need to focus on revenue. So you really have to demonstrate why change by showing the cost of inaction. Um, and if you can quantify that, if you can show there is examples from leading experts, if you have some of your own customers that they can talk to, you uh, reference videos to help demonstrate that why change and that cost of inaction, then that's that's quite critical. That really has to be done for all about that is what is the reason why I should change from how I'm doing things today. Yeah, so I just want to do a quick commercial break. Um, I do really want to plug this book. Um, so what Michael has done is he's mapped everything out in this book. You can find it on Amazon. Uh, Listen, Innovate, Grow. Michael Haynes, there it is. So those of you that are techno savvy, savvy, mark the timestamp or do a screenshot right now. We are, we may be 